Hi, this is Dave Page with another segment of Fitzbits, sponsored by the Friends of the St. Paul Public Library. As anyone who has read Fitzgerald knows, there are just hundreds of great vignettes in his writing. One of my favorites occurs early in this site of Paradise, the novel which is celebrating its 100th anniversary this year. In it, the hero, Armory Blaine, who's 13 years old, is wooing Myra St. Clair, hoping to get a kiss. He looked at her again and then dropped his eyes. He had lashes. I'm awful, he said sadly. I'm different. I don't know why I make faux pas, because I don't care, I suppose. Then recklessly, I've been smoking too much. I got tobacco heart. Myra pictured an all-night tobacco debauch with armory pale and reeling from the effect of nicotine lungs. She gave a little gasp. Oh, Armory, don't smoke. You'll stunt your growth. I don't care, he persisted gloomily. I gotta. I got the habit. I've done a lot of things that if my family knew, he hesitated, giving her imagination time to picture dark horrors. I went to the burlesque show last week. Myra was quite overcome. He turned the green eyes on her again. You're the only girl in town I like much, he exclaimed in a rush of sentiment. You're simpatico. Myra was not sure that she was, but it sounded stylish, though vaguely improper. Thick dusk had descended outside, and as the limousine made a sudden turn, she was jolted against him, their hands touched. You shouldn't smoke, Armory, she whispered. Don't you know that? He shook his head. Nobody cares. Myra hesitated. I care. Something stirred with an armory. Use of the phrase tobacco heart in the passage is ironic, given that Fitzgerald would die from heart problems just 20 years later in December 1940. He had turned 44 the previous September. Certainly smoking did not help his health, and from photos we know that Fitzgerald smoked. While he didn't obsess over smoking in his fiction, he certainly didn't shy away from it either. In fact, one of his last published works focused on smoking. Rejected by the New Yorker in 1936 for being, quote, so unlike the kind of thing we associate with him and really too fantastic, the short story, Thank You for the Light, appeared in the magazine finally in 2012. Perhaps Fitzgerald's most honest appraisal of smoking came in The Beautiful and Damned, published in 1922. Before they had been two months in the little apartment on 57th Street, Fitzgerald wrote in the novel, it had assumed for both of them the same indefinable but almost material taint that had impregnated the gray house in Marietta. There was the odor of tobacco always. Both of them smoked incessantly. It was in their clothes, their blankets, the curtains, and the ash-littered carpets. Added to this was the wretched aura of stale wine, with its inevitable suggestion of beauty gone foul and revelry remembered in disgust. About a particular set of glass goblets on the sideboard, the odor was particularly noticeable, and in the main room, the mahogany table was ringed with white circles where glasses had been set down upon it. The Gray House in Marietta was actually this house in Westport, Connecticut. Fitzgerald's St. Paul friend, Norris Jackson, had come to visit in May 1920, the month after Scott and Zelda were married in New York City. Scott sent Jackson captioned photographs of the house, him, and Zelda. Although not as prevalent, cigars also pop up in Fitzgerald's writing. Mr. Bibble, for example, takes a long puff on his cigar. In Fitzgerald's short story, he thinks he's wonderful published in 1928. Written in the summer of 1922, the short story, 
The Lees of Happiness also contains a mention of cigars. You would look again and wonder why you had never heard of her. Why did her name not linger in popular songs and vaudeville jokes and cigar bands? And the memory of that gay old uncle of yours, along with Lillian Russell and Stella Mayhew and Anna Held. Roxanne Milbank, whither had she gone? No doubt she was dead, poor, beautiful young lady, and quite forgotten. Lillian Russell, Stella Mayhew, and Anna Held were actual stage stars. Fitzgerald-based Roxanne Milbank, however, on one of his childhood sweethearts, Kitty Schultz. And she was alive and well, thank you very much. Just a few years earlier, in 1919, she had married her brother-in-law, Jeremiah Milbank, who, according to Fortune magazine, came from one of the oldest, richest, most proper and least publicized families of the American business community. Kitty would outlive Fitzgerald by several decades. But why associate her name with cigar bands? Apparently, cigar bands have a mysterious history. The most likely origin story is that an expat German named Gustav Bach immigrated to Cuba and opened a cigar factory there. He grew tired of German cigars being sold as Cubans back in Europe and decided to put a paper ring with his signature on each of his exported cigars. By 1855, wrote Che Bennett Alexander in the History of Cigar Bands, nearly every Cuban export brand carried a cigar band. By 1900, nearly 80% of American men had smoked at least one cigar. Since they were eye-catching, plentiful, and easy to store, cigar bands cried out to be collected. Ten-year-old Scott Fitzgerald became tempted, noted in his ledger for June 1907 that he began collecting cigar bands. Cigar companies took advantage of the fad by creating series of bands, like presidents, or girlfriends, as Fitzgerald would suggest in The Lees of Happiness, the Great Depression hurt the cigar business, just like any other, and the hobby of collecting cigar bands suffered as a result. When Scott and Zelda moved to St. Paul in 1921 to have their first child, Scott would drive with his father to Crocus Hill Pharmacy to purchase cigars. Joe Watson, who worked at the pharmacy, said in a 1976 interview with Jack Koblis, that the pharmacy's owner, Wesley St. Clair, wore a billy goat beard and was called Doc. Watson indicated that Edward's product of choice was Tom Moore cigars. One day when Scott and his father dropped by, Scott was driving a 1920s Buick touring car, red with a tan top, according to Watson. Dad, I'm going to buy you a box of cigars. Scott told his father, according to Watson. Edward replied, forget it. You have a wife and child to support. Scott forgot it. Interestingly, Kurt Cobain kept his drug stash in a Tom Moore cigar box. I would not be the first scholar to compare Scott and Zelda to Kurt and his wife, Courtney Love. Cobain also died young at the age of 27 in 1994. According to Answers.com, one of the last books Cobain read was The Beautiful and Damned. I'm guessing he understood his and Courtney's connection to the Fitzgeralds as well as anyone.